Hi there everybody, Michael Valenti here with the School of Self-Defense in Indianapolis and today we're going to be talking about martial sport and how it applies to self-defense. I had a really interesting conversation, really interesting question from one of my uh, fairly regular students. He's an interesting guy. He actually lives in a different state and he trains jujitsu at his college and whenever he's in town he comes by and wants to study some of what we do which is uh, CDS and Jeet Kune Do grappling. And something that is really interesting about him is he is a guy who's very interested in the study of grappling. Um, he has interest in other aspects like striking as well, but primarily he really likes the grappling aspect of martial arts. But moreover, what's really interesting about him is self-defense isn't his number one priority. But something that he commented to me the other day, which I thought was really interesting, was the fact that even though self-defense isn't his number one priority, he still wants to be able to protect himself if that were to arise. By his mind, he says, you know, that he's, you know, he's a white dude, um, he's not a big partier, he avoids violence, he just doesn't think he'll get into a self-defense situation anytime soon, but he thinks he'll be in a lot of competition, so he wants to focus on competition. But, on the same token, he recognizes the fact that he doesn't want to develop any habits that are going to um, work against him if a self-defense situation were to arise. So after a long class with me, he sits down and he asks me a really interesting question, which was how much of the martial sport, like kickboxing and sports jiu-jitsu and sports judo, how much of that translates into self-defense and how much of it uh, will give you trouble. And I thought that would be a really interesting video for us to discuss. So the way that I always look at it is that if you are studying martial sport, you are developing a lot of really important skills for self-defense and it is perfectly possible for your martial sport um, to translate into self-defense. However, if all you do is study self-defense, um, that does not necessarily mean that you can transfer those skills over to, over to martial sport. There is far more overlap in the sport towards the self-defense than the self-defense towards the sport. So let's get into why that actually is. So when you study a martial sport, um, so let's take kickboxing for example. Kickboxing doesn't allow you to use any of the classic self-defense maneuvers. So you're not allowed to poke someone in the eyes, pull their hair, headbutt. Usually you can't knee them. Usually you can't elbow them. And if you can knee them, it's usually all upper body. Um, so a lot of the self-defense striking tools are against the rules when it comes to kickboxing. However, what's far more important when it comes to kickboxing as far as applying to self-defense is you do learn some really crucial skills. Most importantly, you learn distance management. When you learn how to manage the distance, then you learn how to manage the damage. So you can learn how to stay out of range of strikes, how to move into range for you to strike, or how to be within the range of a particular strike. And that really helps uh, as far as self-defense is concerned, because if you can understand how to manage that distance on a really dynamic level, then it's really hard for someone to hit you in the first place. And I would argue that it's only through sparring, um, kind of the martial spark, sport aspect of it, that you'll actually develop the skill to genuinely recognize it. You can drill it until you're blue in the face, but until someone's actually trying to hit you, it's really hard to gauge that distance. But then once you actually start sparring and once you actually start getting into kickboxing, you start learning what your range is, you start learning what uh, your opponent's range is, and you learn how to judge that. Believe it or not, you can train for years in a self-defense oriented art, but if you never are getting together and sparring, not just drilling, but sparring, you actually will have a really poor understanding of range and distance. And every self-defense expert I know says that distance management is the key to protecting yourself against strikes, but if you aren't sparring, then maybe you don't learn it. Let's look at how martial sport sport in grappling applies. So most of the, not most, but many of the grappling tools that we use in self-defense are, are illegal 
in grappling tournaments. So, for example, most grappling sports don't allow you to strike. However, striking plays a tremendous role in self-defense based grappling. Most grappling um, arts don't allow you to do um, some of the nastier things like head cranks, um, attacking um, the windpipe, um, allowing you to slam people if that's an option. Uh, so those tools are taken away from you. So in a self-defense situation, if all you've ever done is grappling sports-wise, then maybe you won't have access to those tools as much as you would like to. However, there are some crucial things that sports-based grappling gets you that simply drilling or practicing without sparring uh, won't. And so example of that being weight distribution, um, good balance that a lot, I find a lot of people who have only studied grappling in terms of drills, when they actually start rolling with people and they get to the ground and maybe they get into like your guard, a simple shift up your hips will knock them over. Whereas even, you know, somebody who's been doing judo for, I don't know, three months, that won't happen to them. And that's a very sports-based martial art, but it's because it's competition-based that you learn how to deal with someone who's trying to beat you. Another example is using your opponent's weight against them. So when you are doing a drill, primarily it's very stagnant, right? So if I have a self-defense technique that involves me taking my opponent's weight in one direction and then, and then uh, using it against them, well, I'm never really going to get a very genuine sense for what that feels like in an actual fight until I'm actually fighting. And the safest way to do that is through a sportive situation. Let's take the major outside reap, the Osotogari. This is a fundamental throw in judo, and it's used basically in every martial sport um, that involves grappling. It basically involves you taking your opponent's weight in one direction and then sweeping the leg that their um, weight is on with your foot. And... This is a really interesting maneuver because there is a really definitive like textbook version of the outside reap. And then there is what you actually do. And if you were to go online right now and you typed in Osotogari tutorial and you watched a tutorial on how to do this throw, you'd see a very distinct set of maneuvers. Um, depending on what art you're looking at, but they're all going to basically involve you kind of taking their weight in one direction, sweeping the leg. And it always ends in a really pretty way where the uh, opponent is on the ground and you're standing. In our school, we call that the ta-da position. Um, and it looks really nice and clean. But then if you type in something like, oh, Sotogari Olympic highlight reel, and you look at people in the highest level of judo getting this throw in actual competition, you'll see that it's a very different throw when they're actually doing it um, in competition versus the way that they do it when they're just simply doing the technique. And it's because you have to make a lot of changes based off of the way your opponent moves. The thing to understand is that fights are not stagnant, but techniques are. Fights are incredibly dynamic and techniques are very isolated and controlled. And so if the only way you know how to do the technique is through the self-defense techniques, then you don't really understand the dynamics of the actual fight. So the martial sport plays this tremendous role in preparing you for self-defense. And I would argue that if you're studying self-defense, but you aren't partaking in some form of competition, like sparring or rolling, randori, whatever you want to call it, um, then you aren't really preparing yourself for self-defense at all. You're just learning a series of, of maneuvers. So where does martial sport fail in the self-defense arena? Well, first and foremost, is in building the muscle memory to end the fight quickly. So when we talk about hair pulling, head butts, biting, elbows, I have had multiple people in the realms of boxing and jiu-jitsu say, well, Michael, in a real fight, of course I'd poke them in the eyes, or of course I'd need them in the crotch. But statistically, that's not true. That you do what you play. Whatever it is that you practice is precisely what you will do when you panic. I'll give you a story. I was one time told this story about a police officer who trained this gun disarm. And the way that he drilled it with his partner was that he would, uh, his partner would put a gun in his face, he'd do the gun disarm, and then he'd hand the gun back to his partner so that his partner could do it again. And he would just practice it over and over and over again. Well, one unfortunate day, the, a bad guy actually put a gun in his face. And 
Just like his training, he disarmed the gun and then handed it back to the bad guy via muscle memory. No joke, real story. Um, and then when the guy, luckily, when the guy took it, he quickly took the gun back because he realized what he had done um, and was able to remove the gun and, you know, stay safe. But his muscle memory was built in to hand the gun back to his partner. And so when he was panicking, his body went through the same motions. So if you are always training, for example, to throw, th throw closed-fisted punches, and then you're fighting a guy who's twice as big as you, well, maybe those closed-fisted punches won't knock him out, but they might break your hand. And so even though you've trained all your life to throw a punch at someone who is your size and knock them out, when they're a weight class above you, suddenly maybe those punches aren't the best tools. Maybe something like an eye jab or an elbow is a better tool, but you haven't trained your body to do that. So you will not naturally do that. And if you have to think about it, it means you're going to be slower in your reaction time. And the average self-defense situation is only about 10 seconds long. So you don't really have time to have a slower reaction time. Same thing goes with grappling. That a lot of tools in grappling are very sports-based. For example, looking at the turtle. That's where people roll to their knees and cover themselves up. It's basically like a fetal position, but your elbows and knees are on the ground. Now, in competition, this is a fairly effective tool, especially on the low level, where basically you don't have access to anything at all. You can't grab an arm, you can't grab a leg. Well, I've had a student coming from another jiu-jitsu school that he'll come in and he'll get into that, that tunnel position, and then suddenly, you know, my guys just start tearing him apart. And he said, and they, they'll say to me, but I thought that that wasn't the case. I thought turtle was a safe position. It's safe within the confines of the rules of the sport. It is not a safe position. I can kick you. I can knee you. I can elbow you. Not to mention, if I'm allowed to pull your hair, grab your eyes, hook your nose or whatever, I can get access to the tools like your neck. I can easily grab your hair, pull you up and, and put in a sleeper hold. I can gladly throw you forward and put my hooks in. That the turtle position is a really, really effective tool in martial sport. So you're talking about like in judo or jujitsu, these might be a that might be a good tool there, but it's a terrible tool in self-defense. But if that's what you have trained, you may not know how dumb of a move that actually is. Um, another example would be a uh, open guard. You know, I've talked about this before where I've joked about how guys um, sit on their butt and hold their hands like they're holding a chalice or a cup of soup. Now, I hope nobody's dumb enough to do that in a self-defense situation, but if your entire game plan is based around that open guard, and the open guard leaves you wide open for kicks and punches and other horrible things that happen in a self-defense situation, well, then your game plan is not even remotely suited for self-defense, and you won't be prepared for that. So what's the best option? What should we do? Do we do the martial sport, or do we focus on the self-defense? And of course, you guys probably, if you watch my channel enough, you already know what my answer is, and it's, and it's yes. You do both. Um, that's what we do here at the School of Self-Defense is that kind of the goal of our school is to train like a professional fighter, but using the tools for the street. So we will do things like study judo, study jiu-jitsu, study Wing Chun, um, study boxing, study kickboxing. But then we will also incorporate those tools. So for example, when we're doing Wing Chun, uh, we'll do Chi Sao, but we'll wear goggles that allows us to strike each other in the eyes so that we're actually getting that repetition. When we're rolling with each other, we'll put on gloves so that we can throw punches while rolling. When we're grappling, I'm uh, sorry, when we're uh, kickboxing with each other, oftentimes we'll kickbox on mats so that we can incorporate a takedown whenever we want. Uh, we will do light elbows or light knees, um, and then plenty of times we will, on the higher level, incorporate nastier tools. Like a real common thing that I do with my brown belts, that's a belt before a black belt, is that I will give their opponent a trainer knife, and I will tell their opponent to only pull out the trainer knife um, when the brown belt least expects it. So don't like start the fight with a knife out, but maybe they're rolling and then da 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 da, here comes a knife. That's actually preparing you for it. So the idea is, if you want to prepare for an actual fight, then you need to train like fighters do. And the fighters of our world are the athletes. They're the sport people. So judo, uh, uh, sports-based jiu-jitsu, boxing, kickboxing, these are the people who know how to fight and how to prepare for a fight. But the problem is their tools are not set up for self-defense. So we prepare the same way that they do for a fight, but we utilize the tools for self-defense and that's what the combative defense system actually is so whenever you hear me talk about cds 
combative defense system. That's what we're referring to. It's a systematic approach to self-defense in which instead of looking at it as purely self-defense, the goal is to make you into a fighter that cheats. And that's what I, that's kind of the idea. And that way you can help nullify some of the situations like um, the size discrepancy, weight, strength discrepancy that happens in self-defense. Because once again, weight classes exist in sport for a reason. So if you're in the Indianapolis area and you'd like to come train with us, all the information you need to do that is in the description box down below as well as on our website. That's theschoolofselfdefense.com. But also, if you don't live in the area, we have a Patreon that you can check out and we post videos on that fairly regularly. And you also, if you don't want to do that, just make sure that wherever you're training, that they offer a well-balanced curriculum of both self-defense and martial sport. If you go to a place and they're not sparring, leave. If you go into a place and they tell you that you can't do that particular move because it's against the rules, leave. As far as I'm concerned, those are two extremes of the self-defense and sport that are going to uh, really hurt your progress as a martial artist. So if you like this kind of content, please be sure to like and subscribe, hit the bell button, you know the drill. Leave me a comment. What martial art do you do and how do they prepare you for self-defense? That's what I want to know. So until next time, everybody, I'm Michael Valenti with the School of Self-Defense. Fight on.